I love the idea of a gold rush. It's like you invite just anyone to come into your backyard and rummage like critters for shiny things. And you just let them. Like some dude finds gold in your river and he's like, yeah, hey, I found some shiny stuff. And you're like, yeah, awesome. He's like, can I, can I keep it? I'm like, oh, yeah, you can keep it. He's like, but it's going to make me rich. I was like, oh, awesome, good for you. I was like, do you don't want anything? Ah, oh, just maybe stay in the hotel. That's fine. It's a weird concept. I don't think it could happen now. After Australia's gold rush in the mid-19th century, uh, new, decidedly non-prison colonies um, started to show up along Australia's coast. And the new residents not only weren't prisoners, but they also, importantly, weren't British. So they brought with them a much different culture when it came to drinking. This is one of those amazing old maps from the 1500s, and what it depicts is the nation of Silesia, uh, bordering on Bohemia, which is now part of the Czech Republic. Here's where Silesia would be now, part of Poland and Germany and the Czech Republic, but don't look for Silesia because it's not there. And if you're looking for Silesians, I mean, you could look in Poland, but you could also look in the Barossa Valley, which was named after uh, an Andalusian place where some British dude beat some French dude in the war. They were running out of names. Uh, in 1841, the South Australian Company sent three ships to Prussia. Waiting there were 500 families from Silesia, a formerly autonomous region that was acquired by Frederick the Great, maybe in a card game, and absorbed into first Prussia and then later the German Empire. Feeling persecuted, these 500 families chose to leave their homeland and take the long, long voyage to South Australia, where they settled in the Barossa Valley. Many of the names of the families that crossed are still on the wineries of the region. Gleitzer, Longmeal, Lehman, Henschke. These farmers tried legumes, vegetables, wheat, but the land wasn't fertile enough to sustain any real agriculture. Plus, it only rained in winter and was incredibly hot. So remembering their heritage, they realized the vine cuttings they brought over from Europe with them were working. So they set about mass wine grape plantings. Now, the vines were healthy, uh, vigorous, and productive, but there's only one problem. The vines that they brought over were Riesling, which was the predominant grape of the region they came from. Now, the Riesling produced by such a hot climate was very ripe, very alcoholic, and it often turned brown. You'll notice that all these pictures are of mild, rolling hills. There's no dramatic mountains where the German Riesling grows. They started planting thick-skinned Shiraz and Grenache grapes, which they got from the Hunter Valley, and they fared much, much better. They still used the Riesling, though. They turned it into brandy to fortify the Shiraz wines that they were beginning to produce, and they spent decades and decades turning Shiraz and Grenache into stickies, and they made a pile of money doing it. Now, as the sweet port-style wines fell out of favor in the second half of the 20th century, the Australian government freaked out and they began paying growers to like rip up their old Shiraz and Grenache vines and switch it to Chardonnay, which they said would always be popular forever and ever despite the fact that nothing works like that. But the stubborn Germanic farmers did not pull up all the Shiraz. They just plowed ahead and provided cheap juice for cheap wines and, until the 80s when a lot of winemakers and wine drinkers realized that Barossa had some of the oldest Shiraz vines in the world many of which were quite a bit older than what was being harvested in the Rhone Valley because they didn't have phylloxera. So the word Barossa began to reappear on labels, and by the time the 90s Shiraz craze hit, Barossa was at its vanguard. Now, Barossa has a continental climate with more variance between seasons and day and night. Although it's still somewhat moderated by the nearby ocean, it has a series of transverse valleys and sloping hills blocking a straight ocean breeze, and that creates a wide series of mesoclimates. So there is more of a trend there towards single vineyard wine. The Barossa soils are basically loamy sand, clay, and more sand. Bad for grains, but good for orchards, and good for vines, which produce low yields, but really high quality grapes. Now the Paul McCartney to Barossa's John Lennon is McLaren Vale, named for, again, some dude from the South Australian company. It's kind of like our Hudson's Bay company. It doesn't matter. But it was settled by two distinct European influences, the non-prisoner British uh, and then a post-war influx of Italian immigrants, uh, both of whom shaped the viticulture in big ways. Now, agricultural crops did do a bit better here than in Barossa, where all those crazy Germans were fooling around with the Riesling. 
So viticulture started a bit later, but it did begin with two British farmers, James Rennell and his assistant, Thomas Hardy. Now Hardy went out on his own and was the first grower to actually start making decent money at it. His namesake winery, Hardy's, continues to this day. Now McLaren Vale made stickies like everyone else, that's where the money was, but the slowdown in sweet wine demand coincided with a post-war influx of Italians to the area who already had experience with dry winemaking and gave the region a huge jump in know-how. Uh, the Mediterranean climate was already familiar to them, and lots of wineries still keep their Italian names, Serafino, Mitolo, Primo, Corioli. McLaren Vale makes amazing Shiraz, but they aren't tied to it, not having as many old vine Shiraz plots as Barossa next door. But the place can ripen in rocks, so pretty much anything can grow there. And it's one of the most experimental regions in Australia. It's really fun to see what comes next out of it, because you never really know. Now, McLaren Vale can be separated into two distinct halves, separated by the Ankaparinga River. Yes. The southern or lower half is by far the most important in terms of grape growing today and contains almost all the region's commercial vineyards. The northern half, the upper McLaren, is included largely on a historical basis as it was once home to some of the region's most important vineyards. Today, it's largely an urban or exurban area, but still home to some of McLaren Vale's oldest vineyards. Geologically, it's a salad. Uh, the soil changes rapidly as you cross the region. There's terra rossa, cracked clay, soft sands, something called renzina, which is essentially cracked rocks. Winemakers here take advantage of the diversity. You won't find quite as many single vineyard wines done there. You'll find much less geological diversity in the southern region of Kunawara. And that's kind of the attraction for grape growers. Now, like, say, Margaret River, Kunawara has a maritime climate due to its proximity to the ocean, which is only about 35 miles away. So the first grapes came here with a Scottish settler named John Riddick, uh, who, apart from being a sheep farmer and a member of parliament, of course, uh, had a huge orchard there, which he called the Kunawara Fruit Colony, Kunawara being the aboriginal name for honeysuckle. John Riddick planted some Shiraz he got from the Hunter Valley, but he was the only one growing grapes for years and years. And he would sell the bulk juice to other wineries. The name Kunawara never actually appeared on the label until Samuel Wynne, who was a Melbourne wine merchant, he bought the rundown Riddick winery in 1950, and he started making Kunawara labeled table wine on a large scale with good success, which attracted Penfolds and Yalumba to the region in the 60s. And what attracted them to Kunawara wasn't the nice views because Kunawara is frankly kind of flat. Uh, it was this. The red soil caused by iron oxide or rust is called terra rossa. And it's a feature in most vineyards here. Uh, the red dirt sits on top of limestone, which along with the maritime climate, makes it perfect for Kunawara's premier grape, Cabernet Sauvignon, which the area is primarily known for to this day. Now, when we talk about Kunawara terra rossa, we're only really talking about a thin strip of uh, terra rossa, which is one mile wide and eight miles long. The surrounding terrain is actually kind of swampy, uh, so the majority of vineyards follow that vein of red dirt almost exactly. It's also where they put the highway through because the underlying limestone can support the weight as opposed to the swamp, which you can't. Adjacent to Barossa is the Eden Valley. And lest you think it was named wistfully when the explorers saw the beauty and fertility of the area, no. Someone saw the word Eden carved on a tree, and so they named it that. Like I said, they were running out of names. Eden Valley has a long history with Riesling, just like Barossa, but they had better success with it. And to this day, Eden Valley Riesling is unique and iconic. It's bone dry and mineral. It's lovely stuff. But Shiraz is a big part of Eden wine, too. In fact, the site that is arguably the best Shiraz site in the world, Hill of Grace, is there. Now, calling Eden a valley is generous, seeing as it's largely a series of hills, uh, forming a bunch of mesoclimates, just like Barossa, but the higher altitude helps provide cool enough temperatures to not cook Riesling. And the Shiraz from there has a more acid-laced European backbone. Moving further north, the Clare Valley shares a lot of qualities with Eden, including the focus on Riesling and Shiraz. Named after the County Clare in Ireland, the first vines were planted by the Jesuits in 1852, and although it first specialized in Grenache, the region's now known for elegant takes on Riesling and Shiraz and Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, we're skipping other places like Adelaide Hills and Limestone Coast, not because they don't make great wines, they do, 
but because their character is still being defined. Uh, they're exciting places too, though. So that's our whirlwind tour of South Australia. Now you have homework.